I'd like to welcome up to the stage Karen Cameron, our moderator, and all the panelists. Do you, you're familiar with the clicker? Just the big one. Oh, yeah, you don't. I'm good. So, does everybody, is everybody familiar with the clicker? Christy, the green. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, going to jump right in here. Uh, we have a, a, a tall order to keep everyone awake after being uh, being the after lunch session. Uh, so don't feel that you're you're going to need to to stand for this. We're going to keep you engaged and uh, help wrap up this great conference uh, on a high note. Um, if I can have you think back to uh, Yosipa's introductions this morning, she put cities and their politics at the heart of today's discussions, uh, and thus the, the topic we have this afternoon, mass hysteria, cities and TNCs. Uh, my municipal perspective is influenced by my current role as the CEO of the Ontario Public Transit Association, but also as the coordinator of a taxi script program, as the regulator of taxis for the City of Calgary, as the director of the International Association of Taxi Regulators at the very moment that Uber came on the scene, uh, and as well as a researcher doing on-street surveys for taxi supply and demand in Seattle and Toronto. Um, on that last point, I can tell you with first-hand experience that there was huge latent demand for an affordable options. People simply weren't taking taxis uh, to the level that you would have expected because of lack of supply uh, and the high cost. So uh, uh, this may be a controversial thing to say, but I want to give credit where credit is due. We all owe a huge debt of gratitude to Uber. We would not be here today if Uber hadn't steamrolled into cities, creating facts on the ground, releasing cities from taxi regulation that had become untethered from the consumer experience. So specific to today's panel discussion, I want to acknowledge the panel's decision to focus our mobility as a service discussion on paratransit customers and on other vulnerable and mobility challenged folks and communities who have not been well served by conventional transit. Uh, municipalities are required to provide transit services to their residents that is equitable and accessible and as such a critical mobility option for vulnerable populations who may not otherwise be able to get from one place to the next. With the proliferation of transportation network companies or TNCs uh, on roadways offering less expensive ride sharing options compared to tra traditional taxi services. TNCs threaten to remove ridership from transit, increase the economic burden on cities, widen the gap between socioeconomic classes, and increase congestion in ur urban cores. So we're here today to talk to about how can cities harness these technologies to supplement existing fixed route uh, and scheduled services, or alternately provide small city residents a transit service for the first time. This panel will look at case studies in Canada where municipalities are testing out new technologies for on-demand and or ride-sharing services in partnership with a private sector entity. Uh, it's previously untraversed territory from an OPTA perspective. Uh, on-demand workshops are the single most uh, frequently uh, requested thing from OPTA members, transit systems in Ontario. And so we are offering a series of workshops this fall on that topic. Uh, and so uh, I'm pleased to, to be part of this very timely panel. Uh, I want to invite you to open the Groupio app. Our prestigious panel members, backgrounds and bios are all listed there and they will do justice to their own intros here as we call each of them up. Uh, we're going to start today with Marty Gray, Manager of Public Policy for Uber. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. I think that's the first time we've ever been thanked at the start of one of these things, so that's, that's a very nice surprise, so I appreciate it. Um, so my name is Marty Gray, Manager of Public Policy at Uber, and it's fantastic to speak to you all here today. And I think, judging by the rest of the panel, I appear to be the unofficial spokesperson for the TNC industry as a whole um, in what is seemingly a debate. But 
Uh, it might disappoint some of you here today that it's probably going to be far less competitive than the title may suggest. And hopefully next year um, we can move to a world where it's TNCs and transit because um, I think there's probably a lot that we can agree on and there's a lot of exciting opportunities where we can partner that um, have just come about, honestly, in the last 12 months, which we'd love to talk to you about. So I think to start off, it's probably important to be candid about one really important fact. And Karen mentioned that in her opening remarks, that the introduction of TNCs, which is, is a term used to define ride-sharing apps like Lyft and Uber, uh, have made booking a car more convenient, cheaper, and a lot more efficient in a lot of circumstances. And it comes as no surprise to anybody in this room or all over the world that that's meant that they've become quite popular. And there was a lot of latent demand in a lot of cities for these types of services. That's obviously come with a lot of benefits for the people using it, but it's also come with a lot of challenges as well. And obviously one of those is how do transit agencies adapt and what does transit look like in a world where TNCs have become increasingly popular. And that is something that's really important to talk through. But despite this, I think what is really important, and Yosipa has sort of talked about this a lot this week, is that we are all walk, working towards a very similar goal, which is reducing car ownership, reducing congestion, and how do we move to a model of more efficient transit that essentially has a car light lifestyle for the majority of the population. And like it's all, also been mentioned today by a number of people is that it's a very simple problem, but it's also a very big one. It's a very hard one to actually change. You know, we've got 1.2 billion cars in the world. It's actually a fair bit more than that now. Um, and for something that's often the most expensive thing that somebody will buy in their life, they only use it around 5% of its useful life. The rest of the time it sits on the side of the road, uh, essentially just taking up a huge portion of parking space across cities. Um, you know, we were having a conversation last night how everybody is got a lot of angst about dockless e-bikes and scooters and how we manage that. But you know, when we think about our own private car network, which sits on the side of the road, often for free in most of our cities, you know, the private car industry has been a dockless transit service for uh, decades now, but it, we don't think about it that way. Uh, and then when we do use the cars for that 5% of the time, there's generally only one person in them surrounded by empty seats. And that obviously across the world takes up a huge proportion of not only local emissions, but also from a global carbon footprint perspective as well. So while that's very inefficient, both from a individual's perspective financially, but also from a transportation network perspective, it's also very convenient. And what we do know is that private car is very convenient and most people do need a private car at some point. And that's why it's very difficult to change behavior. And what we know, both from our own customers and from a lot of research, is that if you want an individual to no longer own a private car or go from two cars to one car, uh, you need to provide a whole range of different transportation modes because there's not going to be a single one that's going to be able to meet all of their demands at all the time. And that is what mobility of service is at its centre. But what we do know is we can't just go to a world where we replace all private car trips with something like a ride-sharing trip because we don't solve the problem then, we just create an entirely different set of problems. What we need to do is make sure that transit takes a far greater load and more people are using them and people are only using cars, whether it's ride-sharing, whether it's driving themselves in a car-sharing mode, whether it is using private cars but just less of them, um, a lot less than they currently are. So one important way that we think that this can be done is by getting what's popular about TNCs and what has seen their growth over the last four or five years and starting to apply it more to the transit industry. And we see around five different areas, at least at the moment, where we see this happening, and a lot of these are still emerging. So one of them is essentially just the on-demand aspect that currently applies to a ride-sharing service, the booking and pooling technology that can increase the efficiency and improve the customer satisfaction rates of customers using a ride-sharing vehicle and essentially applying it to a bus service or a high-capacity vehicle service. Complementary transit, so essentially extending first and last mile connections to existing transit services to increase their catchment areas, or potentially expanding hours of use by them using them in low occupancy times. Uh, next is integration, so allowing individuals to book, journey plan and pay for uh, existing transit services, so bus and, tra and train services, using an existing TNC app like Uber or using the accessible transportation networks, applying that same technology again for booking and payment as we see for on-demand transit. And finally, uh, from an analytics perspective, how we can use TNC data to improve data and metrics for transit agencies to help improve strategy and planning going forward. 
So I'd like to talk you through one example that we've got, and I'll let Paul do most of it, considering it's his township. But a few years ago, in 2015, uh, the town of Innisfil came to us with an idea. Um, they were interested in building out a transit network, but uh, due to low densities, uh, the way the city was laid out, and the way that a lot of people weren't within walking distance of what the proposed route was, they were looking for different ideas. So we work with them to adapt Uber's Uber Pool product, which essentially is a pooled ride-sharing product which matches multiple people in a sedan going along a similar route, and essentially adapting that technology to provide people with low-cost trips between different destinations within the municipality's boundaries. Um, it's been really popular. Um, Paul, Paul knows this quite well. It's probably almost been too popular at times, and now we're at a level where we probably need to move to something um, at a little bit of a higher grade than just a conventional ride-sharing service. I think in 2018, we had about 85,000 people use it with satisfaction rates, I think, over 75% or over 70% at least, which is really exciting. Um, but I think what's really important about this was uh, this was often a lot before the mobility as a service narrative had come about, at least in our own minds. We just had a township that had come to us with an interesting idea and we worked with them on it. And I think that shows that if you keep an open mind and you want to work with TNCs and TNCs want to work with transit, you can achieve exciting things. Um, next, we've partnered with a number of different transit agencies about how we can extend the reach of existing transit services. So in Pinellas County in, uh, sorry, in, um, yes, Pinellas County in Florida, uh, we currently offer free ride-sharing trips to and from bus stations for people eligible for a transport disadvantage subsidy, which essentially helps people get access to job interviews and when they start work, um, it provides an opportunity so that they are not essentially priced out by not being able to own a car, but also not within walking distance of the existing transit network. We also have a number of other of these. Uh, there's two of these in Australia that we currently offer, one that connects to and from a local ferry station and then one that works with the late night bus service, which uh, outside of walking distance for around 70% of people who use them. So and finally, one of the ways that TNCs can help improving transit is by essentially no longer becoming TNCs and becoming a true multimodal platform to get whatever transport mode you need on demand in real time. So in May of this year, um, in partnership with Denver Regional Transportation District, uh, Uber customers within the app could essentially journey plan and pay for a both train and bus ticket via the Uber app. Um, First City, we've done it within earnest and it's actually been really successful so far, which is quite exciting. We've had over 8,000 tickets being bought with about 25% week on week growth at this point. What's been really interesting about this project as well has been the fact that Almost 50% of people who initially bought a ticket are then doing so about a month later. So we're starting to see people build out and actually use transit more and more. And a lot of these people who are individuals who, quite frankly, said they never used uh, the system before and are using a ride-sharing service to connect to their house once they get to the other end. So I'm hopeful that we're at a point now where we're hopefully going to a world of TNC 2.0, where we start to see transit agencies and TNCs work a close, lot closely together to increase patronage, improve satisfaction, lower costs, and extend the reach to greater numbers of people, which is something I think we can all agree is an exciting proposition. And if anyone has any questions and would like to speak to us more or potentially would like to think about partnering with us, please see me after this, or I'd be happy to reach out to the email above. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marty. And see, there you go, 15 seconds left to spare. Uber can follow the rules. They know how to play nice, so wonderful. Um, now my next challenge is pronouncing Paul's name properly. Um, Paul Pentakanen is the senior policy planner with the town of Innisfil. He's in high demand. I see Paul's name on all the best conference programs. And we have him here today to give us the, the details of uh, the experience in Innisfil. Yes, thanks, Karen, and um, great job pronouncing my last name. Um, good job. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and I'm, I'm happy to share a bit more details of our uh, story of partnering uh, with Uber to provide a ride-sharing transit service uh, in Innisfil. Uh, our partnership was launched just over two years ago, uh, May uh, 17, or May 15, 2017, and we're the first municipality in Canada to partner with, with Uber and we're also not aware of any other place in the world that has partnered with Uber for their entire public transit service in the way that we have. 
So that would be helpful to show uh, this quick, uh, it's a quick three minute video um, to, uh, before I provide a bit more details. My wife and I moved here 18 years ago. The town has grown a lot since then and the population has risen. So over that time, there's always been this glaring problem of transportation. It really just comes down to driving everywhere. We've been trying to find an answer to our transit system challenge for a long time. You know, the truth is that with not a lot of population density, traditional transit just doesn't work. There would be a big price tag attached to it, and it would serve as such a small portion of the municipality. We really wanted to be able to connect the supply of vehicles that are moving around our municipality all the time with the demand of people who really need those rides but don't have a way to connect the dots. Pretty quickly it became, why don't we just invite Uber? We were floored that Uber was willing to customize the solution for Innisfil in a way that even local companies may not be interested in doing. When you open your Uber app and you put in your destination, it automatically comes up with Innisfil Transit as the option, shows you that it's a flat fee, and that's it. It's really what you'd expect from a bus service price-wise, but just so much more convenient. It is working for us, and we're looking at expanding it to different areas in the town. It provides links to existing facilities like the Metrolinx GO station to carpool lots, where people can springboard to other transit systems or directly to their place of employment. The ability to have that extra transit option when you need it is a huge game changer for people in our community. It's one thing to see the statistics, it's another thing to actually hear stories where it's affected people's lives. I retired about a year ago and I decided to drive with Uber to supplement my income as a, as a pensioner. Uh, driving with Uber enables me to put food on the table, pay the rent and keep the lights on. It's actually great to leave the car at home now, Friday nights and Saturday evenings that we like to go out with our friends. It makes it easy to grab a drink or two without having to worry about how we're getting home. I do pick up a lot of the same people from Innisfil, so you kind of build a relationship. You get to know people very well, and people trust you, and they feel comfortable when they see you. You can see the smile on their face when they recognize that they're getting you as a driver. I think since Uber has come to our town, it's demonstrated an innovation kind of unique to our town. Many municipalities of our size are having the challenges of transit that we are having. You know, why can't Innisfil be that model moving forward to do things differently? It doesn't matter where I go, as soon as I say Innisfil, people say, oh yeah, those Uber people. It's really changed the, the, the community as a whole for the better. Going first is always a bit risky, but with risk comes reward. So in terms of where we're located, so we're about an hour <clears throat> north of Toronto on the western shore of Lake Simcoe. We're, we're south of the city of Barrie, which is a population of about 150,000 people. And, and as you can see from a lot of those images, it's, we're mostly a rural agricultural town, uh, spread out with our population, and, and our land area is about 260 square kilometers, so about the size of the uh, city of Mississauga. So the challenges that <clears throat> were discussed in the video, as well as what Marty mentioned, we're essentially trying to avoid the situation that a lot of smaller communities invest into a bus service and to have nearly empty buses uh, running around. So a lot of these challenges became especially apparent um, through the recommendations of this transit feasibility study that was undertaken in the fall of 2015 for the town. You see the, the L shape there, that's the one bus route that was recommended at a cost of a, a startup cost of about six hundred thousand dollars, as any, as you can see from the red and green dots on this map, those are the areas through the that same study where residents said they wanted to use a transit service to get to or from. So it was clear that a bus route, um, ex, that expense of this bus route would not be able to service the entire town. And we're often asked, what was the spark or what what led us? along this journey that led us to partner with Uber. And we'd like to tell the story of a woman, a resident in the town named Joanna, a single mom, two kids, doesn't own a car, and worked at a local grocery store. And to get to her job, she had to walk nearly 10 kilometers along the gravel shoulder of this side of the road that doesn't have any sidewalk. And one of my colleagues noticed this woman and picked her up, brought her to, to her, her job, and, her, and learned her story that way. 
And because this woman wouldn't have been able to access that one bus route that was proposed, that's when it really began to click for us that a demand-based type of service was really the answer uh, uh, for, for Innisfil. And if we could simply connect all the drivers in the town uh, with the riders, uh, even a hitchhiking system was talked about, that this could potentially be our answer. So it's a subtle but different way of looking at the approaching this problem, that how do we first connect people to each other and then to the places they needed to get to. And using that different approach, we, we didn't need a bus. Our council was also on board with this way of thinking, when instead of approving the one bus route, they approved a staff recommendation that we be supported to explore a on-demand solution a little bit more. So they gave us startup funding about 100,000 uh, in first year, 125,000 for 2018, since our research was showing that would be significantly lower startup costs uh, and we'd only be paying for the rides that would actually be taken. As part of this, we were also directed to form a transit advisory committee of, of residents and stakeholders to help us with finding a solution. And through this process, we went through a request for expression of interest. We didn't find exactly what we were looking for. So then we approached Uber directly in the fall of 2016. And though it may see, be portrayed as a bit of a, an awkward partnership, a global ride-sharing giant, even though Marty looks, looks like a fairly normal guy, but um, with a small rural town, but it was really, we did find the immediate commonalities in working with Uber as the same shared goals of providing mobility options, getting people to meet each other, and building an engaged community. So we launched Innisfil Transit May 15, 2017, and how it works is based on the, the custom Innisfil Transit fare option as shown in that video, is that the town's basically paying for a portion of the Uber fare. The resident or visitor pays a base fee uh, of what's now four to six dollars to a few uh, flat fee destinations. And we pay the remaining difference. It's four or six dollars to those few destinations and then it's four dollars off what the regular uh, Uber fare would otherwise be. And Uber bills us uh, monthly for, for what that difference is. We also have a partner with a local taxi company for wheelchair accessible trips. And for those that don't have smartphones, we have a service where residents book in, uh, book their trip by calling the town and our customer service uh, department uh, handles those calls. Don't have too much time left, but just quickly going over what some of the results have been so far. <clears throat> our trip numbers have increased significantly from just under 27,000 in 2017 to 86,000 2018. And this year we're likely to, we will exceed uh, over 100,000 trips. Our, our subsidy has also increased, and um, though you see the number in 2018 being higher than what that one bus route would have been, but you also have to keep in mind that we, through this service now, we have coverage everywhere across the town, at your doorstep, as opposed to just within walking distance of that bus route. Um, the rider and driver numbers are increasing. Our match rate is increasing as well. Uh, wait times continually to go lower, uh, less than five minutes, uh, five minutes uh, most recently. So it's uh, showing the increased reliability uh, of the service that we're, we're hearing that residents are, are um, really starting to depend on. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the heat map shows a general pattern of, of Venezuela transit trips and that, that red line shows what the one bus route would have been in the town. So you see that that one bus route would not have been able to provide coverage across all the areas where there is that transit demand uh, within the town. In terms of trips per month, um, you see the, the, the significant growth that happened. Um, it, it is starting to stabilize though now, and this has presented a challenge for us. We had to address with some changes to, to our fare structure and um, that is a challenge going forward. But it's, as mentioned in the video too by, by our current mayor, it's, it's really the stories behind the numbers of just how impactful the service has had on the community. In terms of the youth without a driver's license that are able to get a job now because they didn't have that opportunity before. Uh, the seniors that don't have driver's licenses, when there was no transit service before, they have a way to move around and be active and, and get to their medical appointments. And our, and our public surveys, as Marty mentioned as well, have had a, a high satisfaction rate 
And it's really survey comments such as this that really, especially as a planner, just is, is truly heartwarming that we have had such a great impact on providing the service that has been able to reach youth, seniors, a wide, wide demographic from those commuters going to the Metrolinx GO station to, to those that are just needing it because they can't afford a car to get to the local grocery store. Uh, looking ahead, I, I don't have time to go through all these points, but as I mentioned, we are looking at what the next phase and evolution will be in terms of building in some higher capacity vehicles, uh, maybe an Uber bus, maybe some, some other form of, of minivans or shuttles that could be built into the service. And uh, something too we're quite excited about, hopefully within the next couple months we can launch, is uh, a transit assistance program where we're working with Uber that we could target specific rider accounts where if they're below a certain income level, it could be say half price discounts or even free to certain locations in the town, which uh, would be quite a uh, unique um, a service option as well. So um, with that, I'll uh, yeah, answer any questions uh, as part of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, there was no way we were going to cut you off before you went through that data. Everybody is here for the data. I know everybody's getting down their, their questions now uh, on more data questions, I'm sure, at the end. Um, as I, I promised, we've really pulled out all the stops with this panel. We have an award-winning speaker for you next, uh, Hamish Campbell, a country manager for Canada via on-demand transit. Thanks, Karen. Hello. Hello, bonjour. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here today, so thank you for having me. Um, I thought I might start given the number of people who have asked over the last day or so. Uh, I thought I'd start by uh, telling you what we're not. So I, I don't work for Canada's uh, intercity rail provider. Uh, I work for a company called Via, but they were an on-demand uh, transit company. Uh, we actually do three different things. So we're a ride-sharing company in six cities around the world. We're also a transit operator in um, a number of cities, and we license our software platform to enable others to do on-demand mobility. So our mission as a company is to power the world's most efficient shared rides for cities, uh, transit agencies, and private operators. Uh, just by way of background, our origins as a company is as a ride-sharing provider. We, we started in New York in 2012, uh, competing with co uh, companies like Uber and Lyft directly. Uh, we're still in six cities doing that, but um, our differentiator has been that we are always, or we have always been focused on shared rides. Uh, to this date, 95% of our rides are booked as shared in those markets. We carry four times the passenger miles as vehicle miles. Um, we own the patent to the virtual bus stop. We've, we've always been very focused on shared rides, pooling, and um, you know, it, the, if any of you uh, travel to New York or Washington or Chicago, I would definitely encourage you to try VIA. Um, it's $5 anywhere in Manhattan. Um, it's, it's, it's a great way to get around. So how does that work? We're what we call a corner-to-corner -corner service. So this graphic is showing you what that looks like. In blue are the pickups, and in orange are the drop-offs. And in order to achieve those efficiencies, um, when people uh, summon a ride on their phone or by phone uh, by calling in a ride, they are asked to walk to one of these virtual bus stops, and then they're dropped off at one of these virtual bus stops. And that dynamic routing is where the efficiencies are achieved. Um, so we very much operate like a traditional transit agency. It's just that instead of the, the route being uh, linear and repeated over and over again, it's dynamic and we can do things um, uh, in real time based on demand. In terms of our presence around the world, so uh, just to decode this graphic a bit, and it's, it's kind of tough to see on the overhead, but uh, in light blue is, is where we operate a ride-sharing company that, that sells mobility to consumers directly. So like I said, that's six cities around the world, New York, Washington, uh, D.C., London, Amsterdam, and Milton Keynes in Europe. Uh, and then in dark blue is cities where we've partnered with either a transit agency or a city or a private operator. Uh, in order to enable them to 
do on-demand mobility or to, to power their services uh, and enable them to do on-demand mobility. Um, in some of these markets, we uh, operate the transit agency as well. So our, our flagship transit uh, service is in Arlington, Texas. Um, uh, it, it's hard to believe, but uh, it was a city of almost half a million people with effectively no transit system. And in 2017, they partnered with VIA and we are now uh, the transit service for, for Arlington, Texas, purely on demand. It's been made permanent. It's been expanded across the entire county. So in terms of those two partnership models, uh, one is transit as a service. So that's the Arlington, Texas model. Um, and that's where we're we supply the vehicles, we hire the drivers, we handle the customer service. And the other partnership model is where we license our software platform to the transit agency, or um, uh, sometimes it's a three-way partnership with uh, companies like Keolis and, and Arriva and whoever their, their local partner is. Um, the vast majority of our partnerships are software as a service um, uh, uh, licensing. And um, like I say, we're, we're in over 80 markets around the world, um, you know, partnering with, with agencies to enable them to do this. Um, the next slide is a, is a video. Um, I like to show it. Um, you know, uh, I, I find a lot of people have a hard time. You know, the, the question I get is, well, this is for vans and for small scale services. A lot of people have a hard time imagining what, what this might look like with a 30 or 40 foot bus. So this video um, that I'm going to show next is from one of our partnerships in Australia. It's a first mile, last mile service to a busway, and it's with a, a 30 foot um, bus. that you can just dial it up on the app and it's there in a few minutes. People leave their cars at home. Don't worry about the stress of trying to find parking in the morning. First time, very impressed. It was on time, so friendly. of VIA's presence in Canada, we just launched a service in Sault Ste. Marie with Sault Ste. Marie Transit. Uh, the, the goal of that service has been to convert their Sunday evening uh, uh, transit operations to, to entirely on demand. So they set a goal of increasing the utilization um, of that service. So like many smaller communities, they, uh, you know, the, the, the Bus routes that, that operate in the evening are often uh, underutilized, but for the customers who do use them, it's, it's tremendously important. Um, so, so the service there has been uh, to, to try and increase the utilization of, of and the performance of the buses uh, on that service. It's been going for two weeks now. Uh, the early numbers out of it have been really, really great. Um, it's certainly exceeded our expectations in terms of utilization and, and overall performance. So uh, we're really, really excited about that. Um, and the other service that uh, has been in effect for uh, uh, almost a year now is with uh, RTL in Montreal. So that's Longueuil, and it's called RTL à la demande. And it essentially provides a first mile, last mile service to EXO stations um, in, in suburban Montreal. Um, so this is about a, a service in Lone Tree, Colorado. So VIA replaced a popular TNC uh, partnership or a partnership with a popular TNC in Lone Tree in February of this year. And um, the, the, by the numbers, um, ridership has continued to go up on that service 
um, and cost per ride has gone down. And, and I don't uh, put this up to disparage our competitors. Um, I put this up to emphasize this point, which is that um, you know, there, there's a variety of reasons why um, that's been the case, but one of the most important has been uh, data. So um, you know, with VIA, uh, we are, uh, we believe, the, the best in the business when it comes to sharing data and also giving uh, uh, our partners access to an analytical suite and a data science team so that they can analyze um, what's going on on the service and make decisions. The policy call to how to improve their service. So this is a quote from one of our California partners. They chose us specifically because we're, we're um, they, they felt we were the best in terms of providing uh, open access to to data and a whole analytical, analytical suite to go with it. And um, you know, I think it's important. There was a lot of uh, conversation this morning about about data and privacy and and what it means. And um, you know, I've heard economists talk about data as the, the fourth or fifth factor of production. So, um, you know, it, it's an important uh, component as we, we enter this brave new world of mass and new mobility. And then by the numbers, you know, what, what, is, uh, what do these services look like in terms of performance? Um, so this is an average of six services around the world where VIA replaced an underperforming fixed route. And uh, across the board, the metrics um, you know, are tremendous. Ridership goes up, utilization goes up, estimated wait time goes down, and cost per ride goes down. So um, I thought I'd just finish by uh, putting up this quote. So it's from Professor, Professor Daniel Sperling at the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis. And it's just to drive home this point about um, the importance of sharing and pooling. So he says, the answer is pooling. If the question is how to ameliorate traffic congestion, the answer is pooling. If it's how to reduce climate change, still pooling. Social equity, also pooling. Soaring transportation infrastructure, infrastructure costs, pooling. What to do about the potential negative effects of automated vehicles, pooling. Going forward, pooling must be the principal focus of our thinking and actions related to transportation. Thank you very much for having me today. Thanks, Hamish. That's a very simple message to leave us with. Um, batting cleanup for us this afternoon is uh, Jeremy Eves, head of transit sales for Pantonium. Um, I think that Pantonium is one of the very early members of Qtrick. Uh, I think we had you at the Ontario Transportation Expo at least three years ago now, uh, and uh, OPTA committees, whether it's our marketing committee, the planning scheduling committee, uh, are always inviting the, the folks from Belleville and Pantonium to come and, and present. Everyone's interested, so we'll turn it over to you, Jeremy. I'm, I'm also 6'2", uh, six, six but I'm just gonna move the microphone down a little bit just to, from my, my own 6'2". Um, I, uh, I appreciate the uh, invite to Winnipeg, and thank you for all uh, sticking around, staying awake after lunch. Um, this topic had the potential to be quite uh, antagonistic, but it's, so far it's been uh, pretty, pretty mild. I might change that up a little bit, but we'll see how, how the rest of the session goes. Um, as, uh, as I was introduced, uh, Pantone is a Toronto-based software company. We specialize in, in people transportation. So uh, a lot of people don't know, but uh, Pantone's been around for, uh, since 2011. We have a, a fleet-based optimization engine for non-emergency medical that was more readily adopted in the United States for private operators. Um, and we kind of avoided the government entities for the first little while. But now uh, we've decided to move into public transit because when we looked around at the market um, a couple years ago, uh, the optimization was somewhat appalling, right? Um, people are celebrating getting two to three rides per vehicle service hour. Um, that, that was not uh, impressive to us. That actually is, is just the same as paratransit, um, which was already available. So what we wanted to do was provide something that was significantly better, a true game changer, and solve that problem of empty buses driving around, you know, for cities that are the size of you know, Innisfil, that was a, a, a probably a major issue, was, uh, you know, the cost of the bus and then having it drive around empty, uh, politically very damaging, right? Um, so a lot of cities have this problem going on. We talked a lot uh, during the last two days about the electrification of transit. Well, that's great, but what if those buses are still running around empty, right? There's still going to be problems there. So what we're trying to do is, is solve the problem of that issue. And the issue is because the fixed route planning abilities that were around we're trying to address multiple issues. They're trying to address the problem of, of transit equity, 
right? So we have to put vehicles out on the roads so that we can pick people up. But the technology hadn't caught up yet. So I, I believe that agencies were doing the best they could with what they were given, but now there's a new way to do it. New transit approach has been coming up since about 2014, 2015, uh, fully outsourced uh, transit. So our friends at VIA have, are probably uh, uh, early adopters to the outsourced model. But you also had companies like Bridge and Chariot who are no longer with us, right? Because transit's messy and it costs a lot of money to operate. So unless you have a great model, it's not going to succeed, right? You have uh, ride hailing services, TNCs, who are serving a, a segment of the population but arguably they're cherry picking the most affluent of those uh, ridership and pulling them off of public transit because they can afford to use uh, a TNC and pay the fare to get them to it in a more, more convenient fashion. Our goal was to have agency owned technology that gave that same capability, right? Hail a bus, it comes to where you are and you get the information that you're looking for in order to, to get that to convenience that that ridership is, is asking for in order to get to uh, from point to point but you're also not leaving behind the, the more disadvantaged of the population. You still use the same transit assets, you still have the same bus stops, you just run it in a more efficient manner. So looking at uh, pilot program performance, this was uh, a study that was released in April of existing pilot programs for microtransit uh, projects across the uh, United States, so not in Canada. A couple of things that really caught our eye was um, the cost per vehicle service hour, um, it is not much different to run a microtransit vehicle than it is to run a 40-foot bus. 40-foot bus can obviously carry a lot more people than a van, uh, but you still have to pay the driver. Uh, you still have to have insurance, you still have to pay the gas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, what was really unimpressive was the passenger per vehicle service hour. So it ranged from 2.7 to 4.7 people per, per, per vehicle service hour. That means it was not achieving much more success than regular uh, paratransit or specialized transit service. And when you look at the cost per passenger trip, this is all regular transit. These are just people that are going from their door to, to a rail station or something like that. But it's costing the agency somewhere between $7 and $71 to move that person. And, and a, what we wondered is, what is so special about those people in that particular area that we get to pay you know, $35 for their trip when you have regular passengers in, in an efficient public transit on a fixed route that really only costs $3 a ride, right? So um, yesterday when I came into uh, Winnipeg, how many people here took the public transit bus from the airport to get to the hotel? So four or five people, right? I try and take transit wherever I go because it's a learning experience, right? I don't have to take transit, right? I'm, I'm what, what was the, I'm pale, male, and stale, right? <laughs> so I, I can, I have the privilege of being able to choose my options. Actually in Toronto, I choose around my bike because I, I actually am a strong believer of a low carbon footprint. But if I need to, I take transit. Now, when I took transit here, I left the airport, I walked up to the bus and happened to be there, and uh, I pulled out my $5 bill and I said, hey, I'll, I'd like to take transit. And he said, well, we don't take bills. I'm like, oh, well, can I tap? Nope, no tap. No, no mobile pay, right? So all the options that I'm used to, because I, I use Presto, tap, tap, tap everywhere you go, but I come to, an, to a city like Winnipeg who a lot of people rely on public transit, and I actually looked up the CUDA 2016 numbers for Winnipeg, they're operating at 55% cost recovery. That's very, very impressive for this city to operate at that rate. It's comparable to uh, TTC, right? And so I thought, well, they're doing something right here, or there's a disproportionate uh, po percentage of the population that relies on public transit to operate, so I'm gonna give them my three bucks because I'm gonna help support that agency, right? And it teaches me a lesson every time I ride it. So how does our software work? Well, it works very similar to all the other technologies out there. We have an app or a website, you book, a, you ask for a ride, all the rides go into a common location, they get scheduled, optimized on a real-time basis, right? Um, we guide the drivers using tablets, so the drivers get told which stop to go to from, from one stop to the next. Though it's very important to, to recognize that those routes are not fixed. And we actually don't care where that vehicle was scheduled to go because we're actually blowing apart the, the global optimization every 30 to 60 seconds, we're blowing it apart and we're putting it back together again because there's public transit's messy. You can get delays, people can cancel their rides, you can have all sorts of issues, traffic problems, bus breaks down, whatever it is. So we're actually creating a new global optimization every 30 to 60 seconds. And now because I'm running out of time, I'm gonna skip over a couple of things. So let's talk about the Belleville pilot. <clears throat> so just to clarify, we actually took over Belleville's night service and weekend service after 6 p.m. Night service after nine, weekend service after six. The original service had two buses running, but it was only getting about 20 to 30 riders total a night between both buses. So it's 15 buses per night 
over three hours of service. So three to five rides per vehicle service hour, right? Very similar to paratransit specialized transit. When we put our system in, we actually, it was a, a year ago yesterday we put it in, and it's been running like a top ever since. Uh, within six weeks, we had 300% increase in ridership. Uh, they are now running five full-size buses, 40-foot buses, uh, because of the demand. <clears throat> we're averaging 30 passengers per vehicle service hour. That means we're optimizing for 30 passengers per vehicle service hour, and they can go anywhere in the city. They have access to all 360 stops within the city. We're, we're not confining them to any one location. And by doing that, we've increased the service area by 70%. So anyone can, they can go point to point anywhere in Belleville uh, over the course of their journey. And conversely, we've actually decreased the amount of vehicle miles traveled by 30% because they're not unnecessarily going around in circles. So actually, if you go back, you look at the heat map, this kind of shows you the popular destinations. But uh, thanks to our friends at uh, NREL in Colorado, we did a little bit of data analysis. And we tried to just compare origin and destination pairs just for some interest sake. And what ended up happening is I uh, found out that Walmart is the unofficial transit depot. More trips originate from Walmart than any other location, even the transit terminal, right? So that, that, like Via said, you know, we, we want to share data. We want to help them become more efficient. And actually, by using the data on ride booking times, <clears throat> we actually use that data to go to council and help the transit agency um, get uh, funding for three additional buses. But we told them the time periods that they needed them for because they didn't need them for all three hours or three and a half hours. They only need them for about an hour, hour and a half during peak times, right? And so by taking that data and giving it to them, they're able to go get a, a real justification for why they need to increase the number of service hours for their, for their region. Now, a couple of key points here is, is how to integrate on demand. <clears throat> so we have a, a different way of, of, of structuring this for different agencies, right? So you have complementary service, which means that you're, you're just adding service uh, on-demand service and you're replacing a service that wasn't that efficient. So you can still run fixed routes, but we can add a complementary on-demand service that integrates with those fixed routes uh, by using GTFS data. You can have a supplementary service where you provide on-demand service for areas that didn't have transit service to begin with. You actually don't have to go through all the uh, consulting process. You could actually roll out on-demand and collect data on the fly, right? Advertise it to the local residents, say this is the on-demand service we're going to offer. We're using regular public transit vehicles. And by using that data, we're going to actually maybe inform a fixed route uh, opportunity. And the last service is just uh, fully primary service. So take an entire zone, take an entire area, and turn it fully on demand, whether it's for periods of time during the day or for the whole day. And it really just depends on what the goals are for that particular area. So I appreciate your time, and uh, thanks for having us. And I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation with questions. Thank you. Now, we have uh, questions prepared. The, the panel here uh, have some, some topics. Uh, I'd like to encourage you, though, I, I know there's got to be questions, so we'll defer to anybody at a microphone as soon as anyone has one. Uh, while we're, we're waiting for you to formalize your formulate your questions, I'll quickly pick up on something that Michael had asked about earlier in the inner city. Uh, conversation because Pantonium is also we're working with some very even smaller transit systems than Belleville in eastern Ontario, one of which uh, was trying to convert a, a low utilized fixed route service into an on demand service and ran into the problem from a regulatory perspective that they were told they didn't have the public vehicle license to be able to do that. Now, the public vehicle license was impossible for them to get because the legislation that was written in 1929 had not anticipated on-demand service. And so they were literally in the situation of not being able to get there from here. And it took an interpretation from MTO's legal department uh, by, over the phone, not in writing, to say, uh, yeah, we're going to interpret that as you've generally got a authority. You're generally going to do it in the time frames that you used to do it. So you don't need to, uh, to file any tariffs. You don't need to, to uh, file anything uh, with the, the OHTB. So we're operating in a don't ask, don't tell kind of environment in Ontario when it comes to regulation. And of course, you know, if you're with a city, how difficult it was to get from taxi regulation to ride sharing. And in fact, Uber what didn't even start as ride sharing. If anybody wants to you know, pump me full of a bottle of wine at any point, I'll tell you about those five years where they weren't even a ride sharing uh, company. But uh, with that, I see we have a question at the mic. 
I, I, um, my question relates to um, the the via pantonium. You've uh, I think on your websites are very proud of the greenhouse gases saved by your solution as it's been implemented. I guess that would be versus a base case of a more wasteful transit uh, uh, route planning. Uh, but you're also at the table with the with the with the transit authorities, and I'm just curious whether you've done any attempt to influence the the vehicular choice most notably going from internal combustion vehicles to electric vehicles and how those conversations might have gone because I, I think the greenhouse gas savings would be multiples higher if you could also influence the transition to electric mobility. Uh, I, I guess I, hold on, I gotta check the volume here, okay. I can take that one. Um, I, I appreciate the sentiment. Um, I'm still trying to get transit agencies to agree to go on demand. So uh, it's, uh, that, and that, that conversation is quite challenging because it's not common, right? You look at, you look at uh, VIA, a uh, very well-funded organization uh, has 80 deployments globally right now, right? I'm sure you want more, right? There, there's a lot of opportunity out there because there's a lot of inefficiencies but there's a lot of headwinds against that, right? And so, absolutely, if, if, if you wanna to go to electrification, we actually already have talked about the ability to schedule in charging station uh, journeys in an on-demand fashion, right? You have to be able to watch, a, uh, the, the characteristics are different, right? So when you have a, a, a bus with a full tank of gas, you know it can last for a certain many hours, but with, a vehicle, with electric vehicles, you have to uh, adjust to weather, weather demands and, and acceleration conditions and all those other things. So we wanna include the ability to predict when a vehicle will need to get charged, so you can put in a fixed charging station, right? So we have the ability to support it. Um, it would be a great conversation to have because we are definitely a low carbon um, uh, mission. Um, but right now it's, it's more about getting folks to, to take the, the initiative to move to an on-demand model. Um, so just, just to add on to that, I echo um, the challenges of, of just convincing transit agencies to, to flip to on-demand. We, we do have a number of partners, though, that have used um, the introduction of the service as an opportunity to uh, introduce electric mobility as well. Um, so, so two off the top of my head, um, our partnership in Auckland, New Zealand is an all-electric vehicle fleet. Uh, we also have a service in Berlin in partnership with BVG, the public transit operator in Berlin. Um, it's, it's actually a really cool service. It's, it's sort of um, pitched as a premium transit product. So it's somewhere in between fixed bus and rail and, and taking a cab. Um, but there, it, it's the largest public transit on-demand offering in the world. It just won a UITP award uh, at the conference in June, and approximately half that fleet of 200 vehicles is all electric. Um, the goal is to get uh, the fleet to 80%, um, but uh, there's a bit of a ramp up process to do that, um, given some of the, the technical challenges associated with, with operating a, a fleet of that size um, in, in an on-demand model. Thank you, thank you for the question, Doug? Okay, I guess this question is primarily for Paul and uh, Martin. So first of all, I want to congratulate you on what you've accomplished. I mean, I live in Barrie myself, so I know people who've benefited from, you know, bringing affordable mobility uh, and the outside of the box thinking that you've brought to that. I guess what I wanted to ask about is the, the way forward now that it's been so, so popular that the amount you spend is, as you say, it's comparable to what you would have originally spent. If it gets more popular, it'll go up. But you are covering the entire community and I guess you would, I guess I'm curious how much you're looking at sort of an alternatives analysis, like maybe there'd be some comparable scenario that achieved the coverage and used some mix of different, some mix of higher capacity vehicles, but then you're, you still got that startup cost challenge maybe with larger vehicles. So just interested in just the mix of things you're thinking about now. Uh, yeah. I don't know, is this on? Yeah, it is on. Um, so, exactly, and I'm, when I showed the, the heat map and it showed uh, where that one bus route would have gone, so in working with Uber, we are looking very closely at where those high level, those high corridors um, of demand are. So that one bus route, our, the data is showing that about 25% of all trips would be our picked up or pick up or drop offs are located along that route. So in terms of the next evolution, that does make sense or it lends itself to some higher capacity vehicles traveling along that route. So that is something that we're definitely exploring and we look to implement something here uh, quite soon. 
Um, but fortunately, the, the ridership levels in that graph, it is stabilizing somewhat. Uh, and that's something too that uh, in working with Uber, we did anticipate that with the population that there is in Innisfil that it was going to stabilize at some point. Yeah, just to add to Paul's point, I think you know one of the, the good benefits of starting off with something like this means you only pay for what you use or what you know the passengers are using. But obviously, as it increases in popularity, and it's some a big organisational challenge for us because we've predominantly been focused on okay, how do we provide the best, most convenient service all the time? But obviously, when there's subsidies involved, you need to balance that with obviously budgets and everything else. So. Um, from our perspective, we kind of see this as a good starting point so that you don't have to jump in and have this huge capital outlay at the very start um, as your first service, but you can build up to a level of demand where you can, along particular routes or at particular times, move to a more efficient mode. Okay, thank you. Well, it wouldn't be a panel if we didn't bring up the F word, um, not the one I usually use, but the funding word. Um, and Paul, I will ask you, obviously you, uh, you the, the town, committed to 150000 as a startup. That was the town alone, no provincial funding, I understand. And then two years later, you're up to 630. But by virtue of funding that, you were able to leverage provincial funding. Um, I don't, I don't assume, I presume that the council isn't committed to doubling it again or quadrupling it. Uh, what's, what's the conversation been at council about what their top end is? Uh, so it was approved and it was increased to 900,000 for 2019 and, and 2020. So that's the number that we're working with right now and we're looking at a number of options that we would remain within that uh, moving forward. But at the same time then we're looking at other metrics too that is 900,000 because that was a number without a whole lot of science really behind it. But as we start to stabilize, maybe it is 1.2 million, maybe it is 1.3 million that does start to make sense. And if there's numbers and metrics behind it supporting that this is an efficient level of service compared to a bus service and, and other uh, small Ontario municipalities, that maybe that is the, the appropriate number that, that we'd work with moving forward. Hamish? You know, I think it's important to sort of emphasize or clarify there's, there's kind of two models. So, you, you know, you can subsidize on a per trip basis. Um, or you can, uh, one, an, an agency or city can subsidize um, the operation and, and you can do on demand with both. So, um, you know, if, if the agency or city decides that they want to, and, th and there's valid reasons for doing that, they want to subsidize on a per trip basis, um, you know, uh, there are benefits to doing that uh, because um, when demand is lower, um, oftentimes your, your costs are lower. As, as demand increases and, and as the service becomes popular, um, sometimes it makes sense to move to a, a model where you're not subsidizing on a per trip basis, you're subsidizing the vehicles like you would with a traditional transit agency. You're putting vehicles out onto the network, but instead of uh, uh, routing them on, on a fixed route service, you're um, um, enabling them to be to, to work on demand. And, and I think it's important in the funding question, um, you know, depending on what the goals are and, and what you're trying to achieve with the service, um, it's important to ask that question before you, you enter into um, uh, uh, deploying an on-demand service, I think. Uh, since there isn't anyone at the, oh, Scott? Come to the rescue for you, Karen. Thank you. Um, so we heard earlier about the autonomous shuttles and the whole issue around pilot projects and what would, what would be potentially palatable for those companies. Can I get a sense from you guys in terms of what your thoughts are around demonstration projects, length of time, that kind of thing, uh, talking to, to the uh, reluctance of transit agencies trying to get on board with on-demand and, and uh, fixed route or non-fixed route? Well, I think like, um, like any relationship, uh, there's different personalities that you're engaging with, and I think a city has its own personality, and I think it's driven by council and how things have gone before. Um, some, some cities are very open, like Belleville, they're very open to just having a year-long pilot. Um, actually, they, they, uh, they voted to make the night service permanent um, six months early because it was uh, a raging success. 
Uh, I've talked to other agencies uh, about piloting, and they said, what's the point of piloting? If we're gonna go to all the trouble, we may as well just make it a service, right? So you, you kind of see that spectrum. Um, we're at the point right now where we're happy to work with anyone on, on, on any type of project because the, the system is flexible, and so we can tailor it to whatever you want to do, right? So uh, like Karen was saying, we're working with Deseronto Transit, a uh, neighbor of Belleville, and we're actually gonna do regional coordination there. And, uh, and that doesn't even need to be a pilot, that's service. Like we're gonna put service in to, to do that, help get people from outlying areas into Belleville so they can get employment opportunities, right? Um, and so it doesn't really matter to us, but I think that it's, it's up to the agency to determine how best it will sell to the population and to council and, and uh, no one's gonna lose their jobs because they made that decision, right? So. Well, we have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to plow on. I was looking around the room for Anne-Marie Carroll, but I, it looks like Anne-Marie may have been called away. Um, the reason I wanted to, um, to ask Anne-Marie for her input is because York Region Transit has just deployed a new app for their mobility on a service, uh, mobility as a service approach rather. Uh, they've already done work with commingling of their mobility plus service with their regular service. So in areas uh, where they didn't have good utilization, uh, customers without disabilities are now using their service. Uh, so maybe with that as, a, as an example and a model of what York Region's doing, maybe I could ask each of you, uh, we, we haven't touched much on the software side of it, on the, on the platform side of truly having all kinds of, of options and that, that option part of it. Anybody want to pick up on that? Sorry, can I just ask a clarification, clarification question? The uh, option of paratransit or option of, well, of different for, riders? For for mobility as a service typically means I might use a an e-bike today, I'm gonna to use transit, I'm gonna you know truly multimodal trip, uh, and then combine that with, you know, instead of the historical approach of saying for specialized paratransit buses only, our customers who have gone through an eligibility process are allowed to use those, even though they're out in an area where that size vehicle might very well be the better solution for that that area. Uh, how uh, are you working with communities that are trying to just bundle all that together? So, I mean, I think I think um, there's two thoughts on that. So, I think there's always been this desire to get to sort of one unified mass platform. I think, um, uh, you know, for a number of reasons, um, that may be challenging. Um, you know, VIA in Berlin, uh, Berlin has has uh, uh, deployed a mass platform called Jelby. And you know the service that I was talking about before, the the, the on-demand service in Berlin, the Berlin Koenig, um, it talks to Jelby. They you know through an open API, um, they connect to one another. So I think I think um, you know it doesn't have to be this one window um, portal. And and um, you know to touch on sort of specialized transit or paratransit, same thing. You know I. Th I Paratransit, in a lot of ways, is sort of um, the original on-demand um, and, and uh, dial-a-ride or dial-a-bus. Um, you know, th this, this stuff has been around for a while. So as the evolution happens and as um, new things get introduced, like scooters, um, you know, that's, that's only been around for a year and a half. Um, I think it's important that there's this partnership ecosystem and that through open APIs, um, those, those different platforms can talk to one another um, so that everything kind of works together. Uh, from the TNT perspective as well, um, we've seen definitely as you add more modes of transportation to an offering, and again, to Hamish's point, not sure what that looks like, whether there'll be multiple in the future, whether there'll be a few, I, I, I think there'll be quite a lot. But, um, you know, for example, dockless e-bikes and scooters in cities where we have that available as an option, uh, along with ride sharing and pooling services, we see about a 15% transition from people who would have otherwise used a ride sharing service who will use a dockless e-bike and scooter generally for trips for less than three kilometers and often during daylight hours. And you'll often see a lot of people who'll ride a bike or ride a scooter to get to a location uh, during the day, but then late at night they'll, they'll get a car home. So we definitely seeing that starting to play out. We're seeing some early signs of very similar trends in Denver, for example, where you can buy a train ticket via the app. So I think it's pretty encouraging. 
Wonderful. I see that we're, we're out of time. Is that right? And Yosipa is coming to rescue me. I want to thank you, you for the opportunity to moderate. I want to congratulate Qtrick for this session. It was just five years ago that it was nearly a career-limiting move for me just to suggest that we have a session where transit and taxi operators were in the same room. And here we are five years later talking about mobility as a service. So thank you.